So virtual care is our way to support patients in their own home, but also by protecting patients to stay at home away from the general hospitals and the healthcare services and community health, and also to protect our clinicians um, so they don't need to go to the patient's home. So virtual care as a, as a whole is the use of telehealth and video conferencing to, to speak to a patient and to uh, link them with their clinician. But for Southern, we've gone a little step further and we actually involve, we actually involves remote in-home monitoring. That means that we provide the patients with a set of portable or, or um, individual medical devices to measure their clinical observations, the blood pressure, oxygen saturations uh, and temperature. Imagine that I found out today that I just tested positive for COVID. What would, what would actually happen? Um, so what will what will happen is it'll start with a phone call by a nurse and or other healthcare clinician and they will do an assessment and work out what level of support you need. So it will start with a minimum of a daily phone call and some surveys, some well surveys that might ramp up if you're a bit more moderate. So that might mean you've got other comorbidities or that you are feeling a little bit unwell. And that might mean that we give you a saturation probe and a thermometer mm -hmm. or somebody that's high acuity will get a full kit. And a full kit is the Bluetooth SATS probe, the uh, blood pressure machine and a thermometer and a tablet. So patients can actually um, put in their observations, fill out their survey um, to let us know how they're feeling. And that um, all comes back to a laptop or a computer um, with a clinician at the other end. We can have daily video calls or twice daily video calls. And if someone starts to become unwell, we can get their our doctor to uh, come in and have a video conference with the patient as well. So it really, it's individualised, it's not a one size fits all. Um, our clinicians make a decision about what our patient needs on the day and um, and we tailor it accordingly. So sometimes it's our, com our contacts a bit, um, we have more contact because some people are just slightly more anxious, need a bit more contact, um, are feeling a bit more isolated. Other patients just want a daily phone call or a daily text and they're good to go. So it really is um, depending on what the patient needs. And and what if I'm just thinking about some of my friends and relatives who are not very techie um, and they might be intimidated by this equipment? It's a really simple to use um, kit. Uh, they come with instruction cards of how to put on the blood pressure cuff, um, which finger to put on the, the SATS probe, um, how to take your temperature. The, um, the tablet itself is is touch screen, um, very simple language, press here to answer the survey, press here to enter um, your clinical observations. But as Beck said, the, most of those clinical devices are Bluetooth. So as soon as the patient takes their measurement, it gets transported into the tablet, but also we can see it on our dashboard here. So we can see if a patient starts to deteriorate um, and what their, their ongoing observations and what their uh, responses are to the surveys. And it's really intuitive. <coughs> uh, most patients have, we haven't had many people that have struggled with it. And, you know, I will admit that there are a few older patients that I didn't think would be able to um, manage it. And they have called my bluff because actually it, it's been really useful. And even our COPD patients who haven't had a lot of um, experience with, you know, some of them didn't even know what a tablet was. Um, once it got there and we talked them through it, um, they loved it. And there was lots of video chats <laughs> after that because it um, became it became a source of a comfort to have that that daily contact. Now that actually leads into my next question. I was wondering how people feel about this. I mean, I'm imagining when you get the diagnosis, you're feeling very um, anxious and worried. Um, so, I mean, how do people feel about this, this type of care? So we've had some really um, fantastic feedback from some of our patients. Many of them didn't know this uh, service existed, um, which is why we're talking now. Um, I'm really pleased that they can have contact with a health professional sitting at home and especially with COVID. 
the patients are isolating, some of them are isolating in parts of the house away from the rest of the family or in a in a in a another another location away from their regular um, day to day contact. Um, our clinicians have been able to build up relationships um, so that the patients feel comfortable to, to talk about some of the symptoms that they might not feel that they can talk about initially. We also have a phone number that is available 24 hours a day. Uh, it doesn't actually get used a lot at night, but when it has been used, it has made a huge difference and has stopped patients panicking and going to hospital or just giving them that extra support for, um, for things to do during the night to make people feel better. So we're here 24 seven. Yeah. We've, we've also found with um, families who have all tested COVID positive, they, we've done video calls with the family um, so it, it's almost like a, a family Zoom call uh, so that we can contact with the whole family um, and they can share their experiences with each other and with the clinician. Most patients don't need to be in hospital and I think we can all agree if you don't need to be there, you don't want to be there. <laughs> so the best thing is to be at home with your creature comforts and your own food and your pets and your family and all the things that your bed all the things that make life more comfortable. So it's really important that we can keep people at home as much as we can. But also if someone does become unwell, we can see it straight away and we'll act accordingly. I was wondering about that because I was I was thinking people um, might feel a bit nervous being at home. So what you're saying is that you, we can someone can get to a, into hospital quite quickly if they need to. Yes, yeah. yeah. We have um, medical officers on our team as well. Uh, so if the nursing staff or the allied health staff are concerned about the patient, we, we escalate and we, we talk with our medical officer and they can do that video call as well. And for a lot of our patients, talking to a doctor gives them that reassurance that, that their care is as it would be if, if it wasn't COVID, that there is a clinical team behind them um, and that we can support them where needed to attend hospital or to stay at home. Do you think in a way this um, whole COVID situation has accelerated or changed the way we're going to give care into the future for all sorts of things? Absolutely. Like we've had the we've had telehealth for, for many years. We just haven't used it to its full capacity mm -hmm. until now. Um, I think clinicians were worried about how patients would feel using a video platform for a consult. Um, I think patients, for some patients, they like to come into a community health service. But I, I think we've realised that different patients and different clinicians, different things work. So having virtual care and, and telehealth as an option is, is really helpful. Got here one of our full kits. It comes in a, just a, a tub, so nice and easily portable. Um, each of the kits comes with a, a tablet. Um, that is specifically allocated per patient and that's because the blood pressure machine is Bluetooth as is the SATS probe. So this is the, the little one that goes on finger that you'll probably get in ED um, and then most patients would have had their blood pressure done by their GP. So both of those get Bluetooth, so the patients just put them on um, and the, they take the measurements and send them to the tablet. And then we've just got a little disposable digital thermometer that's uh, easy to read the, the temperature and the patient just puts that into the tablet. And they keep to keep that as a souvenir. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, we also put in the kit, we put some information leaflets about how to get hold of the team, um, how to use the blood pressure cuff, um, and then just a, a quick start guide for the tablet. Um, and, and see that little picture here? That, that's what the tablet looks like when it's turned on. Just got those little icons, touch screen, really, really simple to use. And as Beck said, We've had older patients um, and younger patients who hadn't used technology before and, and most of them have found it you know, very straightforward. Yeah. So the yeah. little clip that goes onto your finger, what information is that collecting? So that's your pulse oximeter. Yep. Take it's, your, it's your oxygen saturation, so how much oxygen is in your blood. 
but it also takes your, your pulse reading as well. So there, um, because COVID is a respiratory uh, condition, we're really conscious that um, the inflammation in a person's lungs may be impacting on their the, the body's ability to, to um, absorb oxygen. Patients may not feel that they're tight in their chest. They may not feel that they're short of breath, but, but this will help us understand how much um, their body is transforming that oxygen into their blood system. Um, and we know from you know, the two years of, of research and experience, we know that a drop in those saturations can indicate that, that the patient may deteriorate further. Um, so we want to know as soon as possible, we want to know if there's a drop, we want to know if there's a problem. Um, and, and this is a really good way to, to be able to watch and monitor patient symptoms. It seems to be one of the main things that the first thing that changes and it's one of the key indicators that someone is working hard. So we can, if we notice that it is dropping, what we do is we might increase their observations, we might organise a medical review, we might get some bloods done. Um, if it's really low, that might signal to us that this person needs to go to hospital for a review and we don't, we don't mess around if somebody's oxygen saturation has hit a certain point and we have a video call and they look like they're working hard, we'll get them in for a review. Sometimes that means admission and sometimes that just means having a team actually listen to their test, doing an x-ray and doing all those extra things to make sure that they're, they're going to get through okay. Uh, but the best way to get through this two-week period and to make sure you stay safe is to have us involved and we're, we're a pretty nice bunch. <laughs> we're a pretty nice bunch. We try. We so, try. <laughs> um, so it's it's two weeks in and out and it's the best way to make sure that you don't end up unwell and in hospital. And like Nettie said earlier, sometimes people don't feel unwell and it's some of the things we do and monitor that will tell us that somebody needs to be reviewed. So it is really important to um, get involved with either your GP or the health service and make sure you get tested and let us look after you for two weeks. <laughs> What's your number one message you like to give to our southern community? So get vaccinated. Um, it protects yourself, it protects your family and protects the community. And you have you got one back? Um, well, number one is get vaccinated, <laughs> but number two is if you are feeling unwell, it is really important to still go and get tested. Um, you still can get a little bit unwell, even if you are vaccinated, and it helps us protect the whole community.